Welcome to another edition of the Corner Booth Podcast here from the Stoughton Deli Restaurant. And today we've invited back our guest from a couple of weeks ago, uh, Pietro Paletti, former Montreal police officer, worked in the crime unit for more than 30 years. And Bill Brownstein is here today uh, along with Pietro Paletti. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to follow up Pietro. First of all, I should mention, uh, I don't think we've ever seen as much interest in a podcast yep. as we did on this one we did with you. We've had almost, what, 50,000 views, Bill? Yes, and uh, that's just on one channel alone. You know, this is unbelievable. So now you, you're you fully installed as a member of our group. You can never leave us. Uh, not much has changed, right? It's amazing. Except everything has Except changed. Except everything. Right. It's amazing. In the two weeks since you left us, you know, we talked about what might happen. Minutes almost later, days later, we've had a, a shooting, a killing, uh, an arrest. Uh, it just it doesn't seem to end. So perhaps you can enlighten us as to the fellow who was gunned down and murdered uh, yeah. outside so, the monster. So gym. we'll start with Francesco Del Balso, uh, a name that obviously we've heard, I think, before because he is not new to uh, to gang wars. Uh, tell us a little bit about what happened. And again, uh, this broad daylight in Montreal, middle of the day, taken out. Who is this person? Who was this person? He, uh, he was an enforcer for the uh, Rizzuto clan in the early 2000s and late 2000s. He was charged in Project Calize. It was a roundup, uh, approximately 15 uh, crime members of the traditional organized crime families were arrested. He got a 15 year sentence. He was out uh, three years, three, four, no, more than that, five years. And uh, coming out, uh, he changed. Uh, he didn't have much money. Uh, he wanted back his uh, route, if you call his run, for loan sharking and gaming, and internet gambling, and that didn't work out. There was a conflict with the Ritsudos and other clans also, other organizations. And according to the police, he was a suspect, or he had orchestrated the attempted murder on Leonardo Rizzuto. So wait, so this is someone who had worked for the, for the Rizzuto, Rizzuto plan, Rizzuto. then decided, as far as what you're saying from police information, to go after a Rizzuto, in this case, Leonardo Rizzuto. It, it happens often. People switch clans uh, because of arguments. Uh, uh, it's, it, always comes by, it always comes down to the mighty dollar. Uh, he wasn't, you know, he spent many years in jail. He probably wanted to be compensated for the time he spent in jail. And uh, he felt frustrated or he wasn't, in, he was at odds with the, the group. He had been previously targeted as well. Two other times. And uh, he was, uh, his time was up. This time they didn't miss him. I think you mentioned as well at one point he had tried after the attempted takeout of Leonardo Rizzuto, he had tried to leave the country. Right. What happened? The officers arrested him at the airport. He was trying to go to Italy. And he wasn't charged with anything, but his passport was seized pending an investigation. And uh, usually they seize it for 90 days, and after you go back in front of the judge, and you can get a, a prolongment. Uh, so he was stuck here. I'm trying, wait, I'm trying to understand that. So they, they take his passport, they charge him with nothing. Nothing. He can't leave the country. That's what right. would have been the motivation? I mean, was he being charged? If he wasn't charged with any, why couldn't he leave the country? It, it does, it, it, that's a big question mark. And a lot of people question that on the streets also. But it, it, today, especially with the SQ, it's common practice, they'll seize uh, uh, the, the passport. It's uh, what we call a... Uh, and uh, that's under Article 485. And you could keep the, the, the merchandise or the passport or a weapon for 90 days pending investigation. Was there going to be other charges? We don't know because he got killed. But I'm sure it was... Uh, Were they trying to send a message to the police by doing this? Well, what... <laughs> you think what, you'd want to let the guy leave the country if he hadn't been charged with anything? No, I, I think what they were trying to do... It's tactics that are used by the police is trying to make them turn them into a, an informant. Ah, okay. And uh, that, that was his only that, that didn't work. Uh, why? Because the way he got killed, and it, his only option was to become an informant. If he wanted to stay safe, it was to become an informant. And also, the criminal organizations uh, they're aware of that, so they have uh, lots of time. To, you know. Uh, very little time to act because he could have done a lot of damage yeah. to... Will whatever. there be repercussions? 
with his death? No, I don't think he... Yeah, I think the people that are associated with him uh, may be uh, fearing for their lives, his close associates. But, like I said, he wasn't really uh, aligned with any other group. But but very brazen, well, though. I, I want to go back a second, because I think you had mentioned originally that one of his associates had actually been taken out years earlier, right? One of his partners? Lorenzo Giordano. But uh, he was killed uh, uh, dates about 10 years ago. Uh, that, uh, uh, no, that's right. Five, six years ago. I can't remember the exact And he had date. worked with Francesco They Del were Balsa. partners. They were partners. Course, they were enforcers. Okay. And I had arrested him in 2004, I think, the whole crew, Lorenzo Del what? Basso for an aggravated assault against the businessman. And just to tell you how they were out of control, uh, they went in Placeville, Mariga, 30th floor, full of cameras, and they beat the person. Uh, full of cameras. Full of cameras. So the, the, these individuals were out of control, and most of them are dead now that we arrested. But again, another brazen attack during broad daylight, as Aaron mentioned. <laughs> the past day, they wouldn't go into an area like that, very populated with a lot of cameras around that gym, monster gym and all the rest. They would pick and choose their spots. I find it surprising the second case of you know that kind of killing in by daylight. You're absolutely right, but it's just a question of opportunity. The the person decided this was the time and place, and maybe had a deadline. You know, I remember when I was working as an officer or detective, and it was raining a dark night, raining. I would always say to my colleagues, "It's a perfect night for murders." But times have changed. They did on broad daylight, pull the cameras. So what, what does that say, though, you know, to Bill's point, these brazen attacks, like they don't care, broad daylight, what, is that like snubbing their nose at police? They're not worried. Or they think there's no or? police presence there that they can get away with? No, them. eventually you'll, you'll get caught, obviously, with all the cameras. Uh, it's, it's just the orders, they're following orders. What state of mind he's in. Like I said, it, it, in this case, Del Basso looks like a professional hit in comparison to others. but. Like you mentioned, there's full of cameras, broad daylight. So can uh, we tie one to the other? Can you tie that attempt on Leonardo Rizzuto's life to, okay, we know who did that, so we take out the guy we think did it, and now that's done? Well, yeah, in, in respect to the police? Uh, no, in respect to the, to the crime gangs. I don't someone try, someone try to take respect, out Rizzuto, yeah. he's the no. guy, they got him, are we, is it over? Well, you don't know how many people he had around him, Mr. Del Balso, how many people were involved. But Which is why you're saying they should be worried now. They should be worried. Not the Rizzuto clan, but the, the, the Del Basso clan. And they have, they have intelligence uh, as much as we do when it comes to their domain. Reg regarding their domain, they also have intelligence. So right now, uh, everybody's hiding, not uh, hiding, but they're aware and they're taking their precautions whatever game. So let me ask a question with respect to you keep talking about clans. So we know there's a Sicilian mob, there's a Cal Calabrian mob. Is this part of that? Yes, there's bikers, there, there's street gangs, there's, there's Lebanese, uh, Arabics, it's full. Uh, Montreal's so got a lot uh, of gangs. A lot of gangs in Montreal. And but this was not a this was not a, an Italian Sicilian Calabrian. No, no, absolutely not. Because there Francesco was, de Basso was not from there. No, exactly. He wasn't uh, neither from Calabria or Sicily, but that uh, outside of Italy doesn't really make a, a difference. Okay. They, they base it, you know, just remember you could be Italian, Northern Italian, and be part of the Sicilians. So since so, yeah. last we met, <laughs> talked, uh, there's been an arrest made in the murder of uh, the woman on De La Savaglia Cano, Claudia Claudia Cano, Cano. yeah. It, just, uh, it goes to show when, the, when there's a will, police put all their efforts and there's an information information sharing with uh, other forces across the country and the OPP proceeded, proceeded in the arrest. Uh, it was done within a week, a week and a half. The individual was, uh, was probably under investigation, probably came out on wiretaps and it was very... Uh, Joel Richard Clark, I believe. Was arrest, arrested in Ontario. Yes, in Ontario. and facing charges. In Ontario. There. When he was arrested, they found the gun and also uh, a large quantity of fentanyl. But uh, some people had been speculating that, the, well, people were speculating all sorts of things, but her murder, some people thought, well, it, it was mob-related. Other people thought it was just a, perhaps a personal thing. The 
fellow who's been uh, arrested would suggest that this is not a per this came from somewhere and it was more than just a random killing it was right which you're suggesting based on the charge right he's being charged with first degree murder right so it was so, premeditated right executing a contract i don't think it was related to any uh, criminal organization maybe uh, like I, I mentioned the other podcast could have been a conflict between individuals and i sincerely believe uh, mistaken identity. Well, that's what yeah. some people are speculating now, that uh, she wasn't the intended target, which I find hard to believe, too, because this is broad daylight once again. Someone would easily see. But it's happened before. He's instructed to uh, kill somebody that's going to be entering uh, or taking a X vehicle, a white BMW, let's say. So he's keeping his eyes on the vehicle. And just for a fraction of a second, he loses sight of the car and he sees just the lights, the car running, panics, and just sprays uh, an array of bullets. That could happen. I, I wonder, in so in this case, if we can't necessarily tie it to a, a gang issue, maybe it's a business dispute, when police immediately charge someone with first degree, you said that's because they, they believe it's premeditated. That's right. Get a guy from Ontario to come and commit that kind of a crime here. I, I almost want to ask, why would you do that? Because we have these sorts of things happen here all the time. Exactly. Maybe. In the criminal world, like the business world, there's a lot of networking. Uh, they know each other. They, they, they crosses borders. Is, is that a who wants this job kind uh, of thing? Well, he didn't, the person that gave out the contract didn't speak directly, I don't think so, right. with the person that executed it. Probably some other person who referred him to this individual. And he had nothing to lose. He was not on bail on a kidnapping charge. So. Okay. But to hire outside, isn't that usually the mark of more organized uh, shootings? Like, when he get someone from Ontario to do this as opposed to having someone here do it? It depends. Uh, if it's got to be a, a murder connected really to a main man, uh, they'll go for outside help, even outside the country. In the old days, you'd have people coming in from Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, famous lawyers were in Montreal. A few lawyers were killed, and the suspects probably took the airplane took a Same flight here. out within uh, yeah. two hours. The Corner Booth Podcast is brought to you in part by the Snowden Delicatessen, where we are. 75 years in business, the home of Montreal's greatest smoked meat, plus Carnotzel, potato latkes, and the famous Snowden Deli party sandwiches. That's the Snowden Delicatessen. So if, if I want to get back to something. You know, I know you said this last time we talked about Lebanese gangs, Arabic gangs, whatever. You know, it's interesting because... This past, I guess these past couple of months, we've seen like fire bombings going on at different places. And there was one the other day, not at a restaurant or a bakery, at a nail salon. So right. you kind of sit and wonder, obviously major crime gangs are not trying to intimidate nail salons. Who, where is this happening? Why is this happening? And who's doing this, do you think? They're using tactics the Italians were, were using in the 60s and 70s, protection. And it's not necessarily the business they're targeting but the individual behind the business. And, uh, you know, great investigators or judges and crown prosecutors like Borsellino, Falcone that were killed in, in the early 90s, they would say, we have to stop following individuals, but let's follow the money. Whenever you work organized crime, you must follow the money under individuals. However, in these rudimentary incidents that are happening in Montreal regarding restaurants, uh, they're asking for protection money. Just it, it, it's, it's a gang that's starting up. This seems like small time kind of. I mean, that those are not big organizations, I guess, looking to. Not big, do this. but dangerous. Yeah. That's what people must remember. It's the so called punks or the small timers that are dangerous. And our police, have we kind of lost the ability to control these guys, in your opinion? I think so. I, I think we got to stop. Uh, uh, when I was in the department, uh, we had conflicts every day. Uh, I and my partners that worked organized crime. We got to stop taking pictures at 400 yards. We got to constantly be on top of them, meeting with these individuals. Basically, we got to adopt them. Just uh, some, like Muhammad Ali used to say, it's not the knockout punch that counts, it's the jabs continuously. 
on them. Let them know they're there. Let they know, know what's going they're on. They're watching them. Are you, your words are very prophetic because last time around you said in the days, weeks, years to come, the Italian gangs, the bikers, the Irish are going to look like altar boys compared to what's coming down the road. And uh, it, it seems quite uh, accurate. Unfortunately, that's what's going to happen if we don't get a, a hold on what's going on. But obviously police... They know these things are going on. Uh, I know the other, I guess a week or two ago, police locally, the SPVM, were saying, look, we're going to need more police. They're counting on the government to give them more police. Is it a matter of numbers, no. degree as well? You could put a thousand more police officers that come out of a police academy, and that won't change nothing. Why? Because they don't know the poor kids that come out. They don't have the experience. So it's not the numbers. And uh, so that's very important. We need better training. I'll give you an example. I left the police department a few years back. Nobody has ever called me in the times. Nothing. What do you think of this? What it, they're actually prohibited from calling veteran police officers. So that information, shocking. Sure, it's, it's shocking. Uh, they won't, I don't know what, it's a new mentality and it won't change. It'll take uh, somebody to revamp it. I think the population, what we're doing today, the media, and uh, and when the media puts pressure on the police, action is taken. We've seen it with the young girl that was killed. Not even a week and a half later, the, uh, we saw results. So that needs to happen. I think the other thing, and I was reading, I think I showed you before we began, so the police have come out with their annual report on violence and gun violence, et cetera, in Montreal. And one of the things I noticed in there was, and I guess this is a move you would applaud, is they're going to schools now, because what we're starting to see, and I think you mentioned this last time as well, are younger and younger people committing some of these crimes. I mean, they don't seem, the culture has changed. It, it didn't take an argument face-to-face -face anymore. Now, on social media, you can be insulted by someone, take that person and go out and try to kill somebody. It's happening, uh, and at least it seems the SPVM is recognizing that and trying to address it in schools. Do you agree with that? I agree that they have to go meet with the the children, juveniles, but at the same token, we have a responsibility, the citizens, residents, and newly arrived. Everybody talks about rights, but there's a certain amount of obligations. We have obligations. I think the population has to be taught what is the role of a police officer in society, and especially the newly arriving er immigrants, uh, police stop them and they, right away the conflict starts. I don't have to give you an ID. If you commit an infraction, you are obliged to identify yourself to a police officer. And that is not taught by all levels of government. Nobody's telling these people, you, you must abide by the orders of a police officer if you commit an infraction. Obviously, you have rights, but you have certain obligations. So we've, uh, we've diminished the role of the, of the police officer in society. I think it just started at a young age, elementary, police presence, talking to the kids or your friends, and maybe get a better rapport. And the other thing that I, you know, it's very difficult to report a crime or give information today. We have a number that's been around for 50 years, InfoCrim, which I don't even know, and I spent over close to 40 years in they should have a three-digit number, like we have for traffic, 311, yeah. public works. And anonymously, people call and say, listen, Pietro, or Mr. X is an order. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that before, the fact that it's harder to report a uh, crime now than it ever was absolutely. before. First of all, if you want to report about organized crime, they'll send a patrol car. There should be a system where you call in, secret number, and you meet somewhere with an investigator may facilitate the communication between the, the citizen and the police. And another thing, we, I, I didn't come up with the idea, but we should have a multi-ethnic squad, a building that uh, the, the officers are come from various ethnic groups. Yeah. Well, especially given the fact you say all these other gangs from different parts of the world, different ethnicities are there, that would make sense? Sense and get away from the pen and paper as soon as somebody calls a uh, name. Uh, communication first. Let's make contact. Get a three-digit number or a place where they can meet besides face the face. resident. Face-to-face. -face. And listen. And, and 
The other thing, people don't really know what police officers do. Nobody explains to them. They, you know, the, for the normal person, he gives a ticket or answers a call. But in reality, there's 700 detectives, more than 1,000 plain clothes officers, and 2,500, let's say, uh, patrol officers, and 125 different squads. So the public has to be informed what the police are really doing. The role of the, the police. Role of, the role of the police in society. Pietro, I, on another level, uh, you've just come back from court recently. You've uh, faced the wrath of uh, the underground, uh, I don't know where. We, could you elaborate on that, please? It was three years ago, nearly to the day. Uh, five individuals came to knocking on my door in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, and they jumped me. Uh, they beat myself up, uh, severely beaten. Uh, and my mother also. They beat your mother as well. And that's right. And uh, thank God there was a witness that took down a license plate, and a vigilant police officer in Long Gale noticed the, the car, and he arrested, they arrested three of the five, three of the five individuals. So that's sad. That, uh, this is... Uh, this goes with at. the turf? No, it shouldn't go with the turf. And I'm scared uh, that's going to happen in the future to uh, people that are in law enforcement, not only police officers, but judges. You, we're one of the only countries in the Western world where judges actually drive themselves to work or take the metro and bus. I, I, I never understood. They should have private drivers. Chauffeurs. Yeah. yeah. The poor man is, you know, he's giving a sentence out or he's listening to a trial or, or a woman or a person. And he's got to have that stress also of driving into work. It, we're living in dangerous times. In, you, in your case, I know you can't elaborate too much, but the assailants, do you know from where they came? Uh, was it uh, as somebody putting out. Uh... I don't know. Uh, there's lots of theories. It wasn't really investigated. Uh, was it investigated at the time? At the yeah. time, it still isn't. It, it, we know that the members were part of a street gang. I, I, we're going to run out of time. I want to ask you one last thing. I yes. would have asked this off the back of the last question, which is, as you describe things today versus when you were on the beat, you think today, and, and I'm not sure this is just youth, that there has been a lack or a loss of respect for police Absolutely. in society in general? Absolutely. And, uh, people don't respect the police and they lost the motivation to drive to work. I meet officers every day and they just tell me, we just answer the calls and that's it. We're not going to do any more. Don't want to get involved. Of course not, because they get criticized. And what about and, the politicians? Well, the politicians have also a role to, you know, to explain to the public. But are they being protective of the police or are they letting things slide too? Politicians say what people want to hear. Right. But do they do? So if people are complaining, they're a minority at all, they'll jump on the bandwagon also. But there is a problem in policing, and there's a problem. And I think uh, we all have a role to play. And th this, these kids are risking their lives. Uh, whenever they put on a uniform, they're actually risking their lives for us. And to what you just said, uh, just to wrap up, so you talk to police on the beat every day. And their idea is, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. Just answer it. They'll do the strict minimum, answer the calls. And that's it. At the best of their knowledge, but they're not going to. And that's one of the failings, you believe, of modern policing today? Modern policing. There's a lack of leadership at all levels. No, I don't want to point at the chief. At all levels, there's a lack of... Uh, basically, the mentality is, don't rock the boat. Yeah. You also pointed out, though, just quickly, that a lot of the recruitment of police today doesn't come from the city so these like the cops who are born outside the city don't know the city and come here and they're not really familiar with what the, what is going on and that has got to be a problem too and you know whenever we put quotas in the hiring system or affirmative action it doesn't work in the long term it doesn't work uh, right now we're they're trying to hire everybody from every community but you have to get the right person for the right job and make sure they have the qualifications and the prerequisites. All right. We're going to wrap it up. Pietro Paletti, thank you so thank much you. for joining us again. Thank you very much. On behalf of myself and Bill Brownstein, thank you. Appreciate you being here for this edition of The Corner Booth. We'll see you again soon.